Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining our public event. I'm working independently with the consortium that's um, running this uh, project funded by UK PACT, um, looking at key priorities and challenges for a just cha transition in Emma Lanchlany and Steve Chuetti. And this is our third public event, and we've been engaging in, um, in various Zoom meetings and workshops in um, Pumalanga. Um, we, we, we have a presentation from Gaylor. I'll introduce everyone and then a really wonderful lineup of panelists as well. And um, our panelists will be talking for about five or six minutes and then we're going to open the floor. And um, please, if you want to contribute and speak, we, we welcome that and just say who you are. Um, between Gaylo and I will try and keep track of any comments in the chat. Um, so I, I, I think before I hand over to Gaylo, I, I really want to just say that um, our, our focus today is how can public, the public participation of workers and communities be uh, improved in South Africa's coal transition and I think we we're all familiar with the coal phase out that is happening uh, and um, I'm not going to go into a whole um, um, definition of just transition other than to say we have to move towards low carbon and if we're going to do it in a just manner that means engaging with all stakeholders um, who are involved on in going to, and particularly those people, the poor, the communities and the workers who will be affected by this transition. I, 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 I don't think the purpose of today is to kind of um, uh, lay blame, if you want, or to say that um, municipalities aren't doing this or communities aren't doing that. It's really for us to, to learn from each other. That's what we're um, hoping with our panelists, that we're going to, to get different perspectives on what is involved in, in engaging together, in talking together and really um, listening to each other and also hearing what others are saying. Uh, it, it's something that we we talk about quite easily, the public participation. And actually, if you look historically in South Africa, it dates back to the Freedom Charter. And somehow, I think even considering apartheid and all the restrictions on people gathering, we maybe got it a bit better. So what can we do differently? How do we improve um, engagement and public participation. So on that note, Gaylor is going to give us um, a brief overview of some of the issues. Uh, he, he, I am, uh, Gaylor is, um, Gaylor montmasson Clair is a senior economist at Trade and Industry Policy Strategies, TIPS. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of TIPS. And he's leading their work on um, sustainable growth. And he is also a research associate um, at the University of jo Johannesburg Center for Competition Regulation and Economic Development. So he's been working on green economy issues for um, many years and done uh, extensive research on the, the transition to an inclusive green economy. Um, Gailo, uh, over to you and thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Peter, for, for the introduction and uh, welcome, welcome again, uh, everyone. Really a pleasure to, to be here uh, today with you. Um, to start the, the, the discussion really, um, we thought it would be it would be good to to provide a bit of a bit of grounding on 
uh, the issues around participatory justice and, and why uh, why it matters. Um, so I won't be long. Uh, this is really to, to make sure that everybody is kind of on the same page uh, and, and that we can have really a conducive discussion this afternoon around issues around participatory justice or procedural justice, uh, which can use interchangeably. Um, and I guess the starting point and, and the summary of, of my input this, this afternoon is, is just from the front of bad people. You know, and and that's really that's really the one summary. If you you know if you remember one thing about just from the sun, and and you want to summarize summarize it to its core, then it's it's about people. It's about people who are at risk of losing their jobs. You know, uh, and, and that's clear when it comes to the phase out of of certain value chains, coal value chain, of course, but even the restructuring of other economic activities and and. People really at 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 uh, a jeopardy really when it comes to to their their employment, but also the nature of their employment. It's it's about people who are at risk of losing their livelihood. Um, so it might not just be directly you know employment, but it might just be the kind of economic activities that they rely on, or or whether it's through their families and so forth. Um, people are at risk of of losing really their, their livelihood from the change again of economic activities that are being triggered by climate change and climate impacts. Um, and then more, more broadly, it's, it's about people at risk of losing their lives. And that's pretty clear when it comes to the impact of climate change, which we've seen you know, in the region, but, but also around the world uh, through, through dramatic uh, you know, climatic events and, and just really uh, the, the direct impact uh, of the environment on people's lives. Um, we can we can think about it in in in, in other dimensions. Um, it starts, uh, and I know some colleagues in the panel will remind remind us of that. It starts uh, with with workers, you know, um, with uh, people at, at the shop floor, um, really who are again at, at the core of this trust transition, and and really kind of then it tends to to kind of uh, spill over a little um, then at the community level, uh, of course, but then through through consumers uh, and, and effectively citizens, right? everyone in some respect is going to be impacted. The, the question is that, of course, not everyone has the same ability to adapt. Uh, and, and then just solution is about making sure that those who do not have the ability to adapt or the resources to do that, then uh, are, are given are given such. Uh, a, a quick reminder about the different dimensions of just transition. We think, particularly in South Africa, about just transitions around three key dimensions of transitional justice. First one, which is the focus of today, participatory or procedural justice. That's really focusing around the form, the inclusive process. We'll get we'll get into that a lot today. The second dimension, which tends to be what people understand mostly at just transition is uh, distributive justice. It deals with that loss of economic uh, livelihood, that loss of employment, kind of the direct impacts of the transition, uh, if there is you know, factory closing down, a sector closing down and so forth. Um, and then the third dimension, which is not so prominent globally, but certainly very important in the South African context is restorative justice. And that takes a bit more historical view looking at uh, kind of the idea is to right historical wrongs around individuals, communities, the environment. So it takes really that sort of broader social, social justice uh, angle. But if we focus for, for the purpose of today on procedural justice, then as I mentioned, a key underlying assumption is that just transition discussions uh, you know, cannot be just without an inclusive process. And so it's really focusing on facilitating an inclusive decision-making and implementation process. Uh, and and that, that takes a number of forms. You know. it, it's looking at using all forms of participation you know, from open direct democracy to more traditional kind of representative democracy and, and I guess anything in between. Um, it's a realization that to enact participatory justice 
we need varied formats formats of engagement, varied formats of democracy, uh, and and that's very important to kind of uh, find a balance between the power of organized constituencies, you know, you organize labor, organize business, government, uh, the desire for participatory and open procedures to make sure that everyone has a voice, everyone can participate, but then also the need to bring in expertise, evidence, you know, to bring in the research to make sure that it's evidence-based rather than, than opinion-based. So trying to find that balance uh, is, is important. It's also important to, to use multiple platforms because we need to build trust between stakeholders, but also in the transition process itself. And so having a multiplicity of channels is critical. It's not going to be one channel that's going to be used to achieve procedural justice. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be inclusive at all. Um, if we think about the key principles for, for procedural justice, the first one is, is really around dignity and respect. It's about all individuals should be treated with you know, respect and dignity. It, it must be an inclusive production process. Everyone, as I say, has an equal weight, providing they bring evidence, and it's participatory in nature. It's not extractive. You know, we think about it often in research. How can we get interaction that's not extractive? But you know, it's even more important when this kind of decision making and implementation processes that it is inclusive. It's not a one way tick box exercise. It's, it goes both ways. Voice, of course, uh, everyone has a voice and can share and, you know, uh, and get their voice heard. It's a bottom-up process that, that complements the existing kind of more representative top-down top -down process. Um, it's, it's about empowering and making sure that people have the ability to participate. You know, it's not enough to say, oh, I've invited people to participate, you know. Have we empowered people to actually take part? Uh, have they been supported to do so? Uh, and do we affirm as well as community level participation um, you know, at, all, at all levels effectively? Do we have you know, a, a system that is neutral, impartial, transparent? So is it evidence-based or is it kind of whoever shots the loudest that, that gets, gets in the way? No, is it, do we have the evidence and can everyone bring the evidence? Are they supported in bringing the evidence? Do we have equal and restricted access to information? Uh, and, and, and are people supported to, to gather those informations and, and this evidence and bring it forward? It's, it's again uh, about resources. Otherwise, it tends to have the more powerful and wealthy side of the equation that bring their own evidence, but then everyone else is, is more restricted to do that. And then can we trust the process? Now, is it ongoing? Uh, is it you know, or is that a tick box exercise? Does this start way before decisions are made? Does it end after decisions are made so that we can have course correction, we can have monitoring and evaluation? Or again, is it just, you know, oh, we've got to do this, tick a box. Um, is it more permanent and, and is it clear and explicit? These are some of the key, effectively, some of the key principles. In, in South Africa, you know, everyone kind of knows this, but we, we have quite a rich history of grassroots and bottom mobilization. As Peter introduced uh, earlier, it kind of dates back to, of course, the days of the, the struggle against apartheid. Um, and as, as a result, in, in entering into the democratic era, a lot of public participation processes were integrated into, into, uh, into the daily life, I guess. Um, certainly through what committees, school governing bodies, clinic committees, but also the community policing forums where some of the the main channels that were utilized. What we know though, is that of course, with that, the other side of the coin is that is a legacy of exclusion and oppression uh, that has been uh, perpetuated effectively uh, you know, by a very extractive model of development uh, and, and a participatory policy making, uh, taking a bit of a downturn in, in the last couple of decades. That has led, you know, and we see it uh, every, every election cycle and in a, declining trust towards representative democratic processes and an acknowledgement that the established structures have not really delivered uh, on participatory democracy. Um, and that, you know, that's clear through the structures, but it's also clear through you know, some of the public participation processes that, that are in, in law, uh, uh, such as social and labor plans or our uh, environmental assessments, for instance. 
But it's also true that the community level capacity and, and capability uh, have materially eroded compared to you know, the early days of democracy. Um, with many people involved at the community level entering government or changing, changing lives uh, and, and having you know, new individuals coming in. Um, that has led to a bit of a recomposition of the civil society landscape. Uh, and as in, in some parts, we weakened some of the, the grassroots links um, that were stronger, um, let's say, a couple of decades ago. Effectively, though, um, both open direct democracy and representative democracy have been explored in South Africa to, to support just transition, or at least to, you know, to try and get a, a social compact for just transition. On the representative um, democratic side, uh, of course, NEDLAC uh, as a, as a multi-stakeholder body um, has been central in, in trying to broker social, social dialogue and consensus. And we've had government, labor, uh, business, and civil society uh, represented at NEDLAC in various chambers. And the same social partners uh, also form the basis of many nationwide agreements, you know, uh, things like our decent work uh, program, things like our Green Economy Corps, uh, and many other agreements, a uh, lot of master plans at sectoral level tend to also be you know, inked by, by those social partners. We also know, of course, that the representativity and effectiveness of NEDLAC has been questioned over the years, and, and that calls, I think, for, for a recommitment to, to, to the institution and the dialogue. More recently, um, we've had the establishment of the Presidential Climate Commission, um, which is, again, a multi-stakeholder uh, Apparatus gathering government, labor, uh, business, civil society, research, and which is to steer South Africa just transition effectively going forward. On the, on the grassroots level, we've had a wide array of, of NGOs and CBOs that have really been cementing and stimulating that, that grassroots engagement. Um, it's very rich, there's a lot happening, but often Problematically, there is no structured channels that, that exist so that whatever happens at the grassroots level gets reflected uh, or integrated at national level. You know, it's, there are some ways, but it's not uh, structured uh, generally. And that's often a problem to make sure that we have this link between top-down and bottom-up processes uh, and that you know, we, we have that inclusion. Of course, there are other processes that have been try, uh, trying to be more bottom-up. Just one example is the NPC, the National Planning Commission process in 2018, 2019, that ran a wide array of, of, of debates at local level on just transition. But that's just one example, of course. So if we look ahead, uh, we can think about what is required to achieve procedural justice. And I think the first level uh, of ambition is really around having the engagements, being transparent about them, uh, making sure that there are some forums um, and that we can engage um, and making sure that information is available, is public and open. But that's really effectively just the first level. It's kind of almost what's, what's already happening now in some respect with a bit of tweaking and, and enforcement. Going further means really being serious about relooking at the structures at firm level, at the sector level, but also at the community level. Can we have structured engagements forums? Uh, can we utilize those to have social dialogue? Can we develop the capacity of local stakeholders? Um, and, and can we really be fully transparent about all the decision-making processes uh, so that everyone who wants to be involved uh, can, can be involved? Um, <clears throat> then, uh, the third level of ambition really is, is around, can we, can we really have social dialogue? Can we, can we co-develop? Can we co-create a just tradition and the plans that are required? Um, and do we have the active support mechanisms for participation of all the neuromastic stakeholders? So that again, it's not about forcing people to be involved, but that all those who want to be involved can be involved in decision-making uh, processes. And I guess 
this is not comprehensive by any means, but that helps to think about increasing ambition uh, going forward as we, as we move towards where we are today to where we want to be uh, tomorrow. So in conclusion, uh, if, we, if we look ahead, we must be reminded that there is no just transition without participatory justice. Uh, we need bottom-up processes, merging top-down, often top-top processes, uh, and you know, effectively the voice of people matters. Um, and that's really important. And that's why we are all here today. Thankfully, I would say we have many channels that already exist in South Africa. Um, they can be used uh, to foster participatory justice. Um, but we know uh, these are you know, not adequate at the moment. The status quo is not inclusive. Um, but if we can use the existing mechanisms and channels we can rekindle them, we can harness them for just transition, then we can uh, achieve a participatory uh, justice going forward. That's all I wanted to share as a way of interject uh, the topic for today. I thank you and I very much look forward to the discussion. Peter, oh, back to you. Thank you, Gaylor. I think um, you, you've You've given a really lovely uh, introduction and overview to, to the issues. And what, what I'm going to do now is draw on our panel um, to, to kind of bring actual concrete examples, their examples of, um, of engaging in public participation in, through their work with communities, through local government, through um, and the, the labor perspective. And I'm going to, to start with, um, to welcome Matsapiso Makabani, who is the assistant director, sorry, CEO um, for the Green Business College. She's owner of Safe Energy Depot, and coordinator of Gender and Energy Network of um, South Africa. I, I've known Matsu Piso for a long time. She's got uh, over 25 years of work in the energy, climate and environment sector. And she's championed and started a number of social enterprises in the green economy space. And I think you've got a passion and expertise in commu community consultation, um, and focusing on women and youth, but uh, I, I think we would love to hear from you. Um, if, if I can hold the space quite tightly, because we, we've got about 70 participants, including all of, of, of us, and I really feel that if we can hear voices from the people who are in this, um, in this room, so to speak, uh, we, we, we need to really learn from one another. And I think um, I, 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 I just um, want to remind us of, this is uh, the, some of what Gaylor spoke about, dignity, respect, trust, um, transparent, inclusive. So I'm really hoping that today will bring some of that. So that's a piece of, thank you for giving our time. And yeah, people, please, everyone, please feel free to engage in the chat as well, because sometimes internet's difficult or it's a bit intimidating, but I'm hoping you'll all feel free. So that's a piece of thank you. Over to you. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Peter, and thank you for all the participants in this, uh, in this workshop, this webinar. Um, you know, alongside the many issues that have been highlighted, for me, people are very important. That is why government um, you know, adopted Batubili, a principle which says people are so important than any other development or even be more important than even money itself. Um, and currently in 2021, people are faced with so many issues, apart from inequality, apart from poverty, 
people are, are, are faced with so many inequality, I mean, uh, challenges. And I'm going to mention a few um, in addition to already mentioned uh, issues, politics and political instability. We are coming from elections now and uh, people, you know, and politics and political uh, stability or instability thereof impact on service delivery and uh, access to basic services like water, energy, and clean environment and all. Um, corruption, you know, um, you know, over the years we have been seeing commission after commission and people get depressed because they are affected one way or the other uh, by corruption at any given level. Criminality, crime and gender-based violence. Um, at the moment, there is so much, you know, we are not, we're no longer safe in South Africa, not safe anywhere else, because as people become poorer and poorer and poorer, then crime goes onto the increase. That alone, the depression and the gender BV and I mean, the GBV and, and all that, there is so much sickness. People are so sick. We have lost, because of COVID and the pandemic, we, we are, we, you, know, you know, we have lost a lot of people and that adds pressure on us as people and we become very broken, we become wounded, we become pressure, pressured, we become negative. And, uh, and of course, apart from everything else, we've always had climate change as a pandemic. And now coupled with COVID, it's just havoc. And the mental stability of the very people that we said are very important is at stake here. And if we want people to participate, we must be aware of the issues that are facing, that are faced with um, when we, we expect them to participate effectively in decision making about just transition from coal to uh, the green economy. Um, and my, my experience, you know, uh, you know, over 20, 25 years of working or being a foot soldier and advocate in terms of people's empowerment and um, people's participation in development. Because I also believe, I'm a firm believer that there's nothing for us without us. You can be um, experts, and researchers in your own right. Um, but if you don't know our issues and you don't even come to us to give us the space to let you know about our, our needs and our problems and also our solutions, how do we how would we propose um, we do we do a, a very good change for our good? Uh, so we people are, are very important and therefore um, we need to make sure that we are aware of where people are before we can even engage, um, I mean, expect them to participate or let alone even to, to, to be the change that they want to be because the very change that you are proposing, the development that you are proposing, that's not for us, but it's for the, for the people, for the communities, affected communities. So, you know, I, in, my, in my life, I have this concept of, of saying people must change. You know, change and um, you know action. It's all a mindset. Uh, it happens in the mind before it can happen physically. So um, I'm I'm a very firm believer that everyone, before you can decide, you have to want to be there to 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 be the change that you want to see and be part of it, and also change in your own thinking. Don't expect um, handouts. Don't expect things to happen while you are sitting at your corner, but rather be present, be willing, be available to do the hard work and, um, and then uh, hoping the money and the rewards will come later. So um, our experience has always been um, to look at uh, the, the mechanisms, the, you know, the platforms that we are using. First of all, it's all about the very starting point is about information and awareness. People cannot embrace any, any kind of change if they don't know what this change is and what, what is in it for them. So information and awareness is number one. Number two is you want to give people the skills and the knowledge so that they can develop the passion to, be, you know, to, to actively participate in the very change that we want them to, to, to participate in. 
you know, uh, because decision making is not about sitting in the boardrooms and uh, deciding and just raising your voice and saying this should be this, but it's about actively participating and making the change, being the change and making the change that you want to see. Um, what I've also realized is that um, I've been involved for many years up until now, I'm involved in community participation projects where we realize that because people are so pressured and they're so pressed and they have a lot of issues, people are hungry, people are sick, people are broken, people are wounded, people are, are hopeless. Then what we do is we, we register them, we include them as part of the network, as part of the stakeholders and it has to be structured and let's register their interest um, and, and have it formally written and have questionnaires where within any program where you want the public to participate uh, in decision making, let them register somewhere in a structured manner. Once they have registered, uh, include them in the activities um, that uh, you want you are, you are spearheading in the community. Um, and these activities, once you include in them, you want them to be foot shoulders of the changes that you want to see. While they are involved, let them, don't promise them money as yet. Observe people who are committed, who are dependable, who are present and keep the register on. And then in the process, pair that, couple that with giving the skills, teaching them something so that it will be beneficial for them in the long run to really get out of poverty, get themselves out of poverty and not really look for jobs, um, but really now uh, be producers themselves, producers of, okay, producers of, uh, of goods and products that, you know, that we can, Peter, I see you, I'm, I'm rounding up, I'm rounding off. So give them skills, don't give them money as yet, but let them be, be involved. Once they are being involved, mark the register, realize those people and throw in incentives and um, throw in incentives, including monetary incentives so that they can participate effectively and they can earn something. Because now you have, you have a certain that they are really, uh, are not just wanting to just talk, but they are really even acting in that change. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matsapisa. I, I, I think you've said some really important things and I, I just want to draw out a couple of them, which hopefully we'll take up in the discussion. I think what you, you started off by just saying that there's a lot of um, pain and hopelessness. People are in the situation is really hard for a lot of people. And this is about people. And you, you're saying we need to understand how the, the lives of people before we can start uh, um, talking about public participation. But I, what I also like is you, you're advocating that, that people aren't passive participants. They've got to be actively willing to change. And that comes first as a mindset, and then you engage in... in uh, meetings, but you. The other thing that I think is, I mean, you said a lot of really important things, but we had workshops in Mpumalanga last week, and the information, it, awareness, and education came up really strongly. Uh, and I think for a lot of people working in the space of a green economy, just transition. We, we, we use a language that we're very familiar with, and I, I think it's very important that there's an understanding of the plight of people, the lives that they're living, but for people to understand how a transition could benefit them. So thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to move on and um, welcome Michael Nkosi, who is um, from Steve Chwete um, Municipality. He's the Assistant Director for Local Economic Development in, in the municipality. I think most people will know that the municipality is house, houses many mines and power stations. Um, he has 29 years of experience in the private and public sector, SF, S, small B, 
business development and entrepreneurship and postgraduate studies in project management, economic and development policies. And um, Michael, we've, you've, you've joined us before and um, really thank you for, for being here again. We look forward to hearing from your side, which is uh, the local government side. That, and I know Steve Tretti has done a lot of public participation in your municipal area. Thank you. Thanks, Peter, and good afternoon again to colleagues and participants on this platform. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very big issue that speaks directly to us and how we, we're living our life uh, transition and the fact that we are a mining town, we directly affected. In fact, we more than anyone affected. If you exclude Malatleni, we the most hard hit municipality in terms of this just transition process. And from my observation, having been involved in, in, in this issue for some time, I have my, my reservation in terms of how it is done. Is it done correctly? And correctly in this instance implies, is it involving the most directly affected people? Maybe right at the end, my answer will be no. But let's look at a few issues that uh, I'm observing. Structurally, yes, we might have the right structures, the right platforms to for participation purposes, where whether you're talking national, you're talking province, you're talking local municipalities. Yes, we do have structures that we have put in place as dictated by the various legislations. Uh, what committees, for instance, or future forum or engagement forums in as far as the mining sector is concerned. Some companies will also have some community development uh, platforms. But are these structures and platforms used correctly and for the right purpose? My answer is no. Because in most instance, we're using them for compliance purposes. Tick the box. Yes, we have engaged them. Yes, here's a register. Here's evidence that, yeah, we have involved the community or the affected communities around a particular issue, let alone just transition, which will affect all of us. But are we using those platforms, the structures we have created, to draw inputs from the communities? that will influence how we structure the very end product, the reports that will be entertained at different levels of government or even the private sector. I have my doubts. Secondly, are we using these platforms and structures for a regular feedback to the very same communities? I'm doubting if we 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 on that track. I'm doubting if we using them in that manner. Because when, for instance, when a mine starts, yes, there will be some consultation as required by the Act that will be presented to DMR or DMRE. But are we using the same process a few months, years down the line to provide feedback to the affected co uh, communities? No. The third aspect you'll observe is that we don't even use these platforms for monitoring and evaluation. Can communities hold those that are doing business, those that are doing whatever activities in their communities accountable for the activities they are doing in the very same communities. We not, and yet we have these structures legislated, we have these structures populated with so many committees and substructures, but we not using them for evaluating the activities that are affecting the environment, even if we were to transit and change 
whatsoever. So we're not utilizing these correctly. Secondly, maybe let's look at the intergovernmental relations. Its government is big, bulky, poorly structured, fragmented, duplicating things, not coordinated in a manner that ensures the flow of information between government entities, de departments, and development agencies, let alone government interacting with the broader communities. That is even worse. So are we using that intergovernmental relations to disseminate the right information? My answer is still no. We're only using this for reporting purposes. We're only using this for compliance, but we have never used them for drawing inputs, for holding whoever accountable for activities done in communities. Communities will be in the dark in terms of what's happening around them, some activities that are damaging the environment will be conducted, and yet there will be no platforms utilized, which we have, by the way, there will be no plat those platforms will not be utilized to feed back to communities, to disseminate information, to draw even input that will be considered when decisions are made. So in that way, we, we have a situation where whatever is happening is right at our doorstep, we're not informed, we're not told, let alone getting involved and giving input. And if you look at business structures themselves, all that business does is to ensure that they comply to government at a cost, high premium to communities around them. If you take mining, for instance, as long as they complying to environmental laws, the water licensing, the mining permits and licensing, the impact they have on communities is enormous, but there's nothing that holds them accountable once licenses are granted. Because if blasting happens, housing are cracked, and what they will show it's on paper, that yes, this distance is permitted in terms of legislation between residents and the mining operations. And yet, in reality, mining has enormous impact on our living. So we're utilizing legislation, we're utilizing those platforms for the interest of a particular group or sectors, but to the exclusion of, 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 of the product community. Business will have a different interest because their focus is to maximize profits and get as much as possible out of the situation without taking into cognizance the impact that they have on, 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 on communities. Now, based on this, we, we, we still have some work to do in terms of improving participations. Yes, we have created structures and there's legal legislative framework created so that we can have these platforms. But how effective are we using them becomes another question. Government in relating to each other, there's still so much to be done in order to ensure that the communities affected are involved and in fact give input to our reporting. Business as well has a role to play. It's not necessarily about profits and, and profits only. Some community responsibility has to be considered in terms of what we do and in us relating to the broader community. So if we look at those, then we'll begin to improve the public participation. And if you ask the question, is the just transition just? It is not. Maybe let me pause here for now. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Uh, I think um, you've given an amazingly um, honest 
a really remarkably honest account, and I thank you for that. I, I've, I've made notes as you were talking, as I always do, and I, I've underlined so many no's and so many I have my doubts. And um, but you, you, you I, 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 I think it's everything that you have said is true. And as um, Anna Marta has put in the chat, well, well articulated, well said. And so, so I, I, I think you, you've opened a space um, for us to really engage honestly. And I really thank you for that. Um, you, you ended for me on a positive note, even though it's quite a grim picture that you painted around the, the compliance tick box, the structures are there, but it's just not working. That's the bottom line. You said we have to do something to improve those structures. And there's so much to be done and we need business and communities to be involved. And Gaylor in the introduction also talked about the structures. So I would love us to really grapple with that a bit today. I don't think we can solve it, but it would be wonderful to hear from um, the participants' views about how, how do we do that. So um, really, thank you, um, Michael, for your contribution. I, I'd like to move on and, and welcome Matthew Schlabani, who uh, is joining us today as well. And um, he is the coordinator of the Southern Africa Green Revolutionary Council, um, which is based in Emelan Schleni. And you're doing some amazing work there. And I think you, you can maybe speak to some of that. You've, you've worked for the mining affected communities um, United in Action, um, and you're the national organizer of the right to say no and cry of excluded, SAMAC. I'm not sure what that stands for. I think it's a loose network of mining affected communities. And you, you really focus on environmental justice struggles. And this has led you to engage with mining communities. And um, it, I, 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 I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and meeting you virtually. Um, but um, it'd be interesting also your res response a little bit to Michael, but um, thank you very much. And we look forward to hearing. Uh, thank you, Peter. And um, good afternoon to all the participants, uh, comrades, uh, community activists, researchers uh, who are present in this webinar. I would like to share my slides so that I can be able to keep myself to, to time. Uh, let me start by saying as transition is not only about uh, switching from uh, fossil fuels to the renewables. It is a radical and systematic societal shift that is a paradigm shift. It is a radical participatory processes in which communities and workers play an active role in decisions to determine their future. It prioritizes human rights and the rights of nature, promotes solidarity, transparency, and democracy, seeks to transform power relations. I think that is um, something very important to note, to say that it seeks to transform power relations. I relate this to also what the previous uh, panelist said, Mike, about the structures in, in, in the various uh, spheres of government. I think the biggest problem is uh, that we are facing there is other power relations. 
and it promotes the emergence of alternatives to a sustainable future. I think if you visit most of these uh, mining affected communities in Emalache and Steve Jwete, you see communities trying to do something, but because of the element of power relations and whether those that are in power are prioritizing something or that which the communities are trying to do is relevant or not, but it's something that we need to talk about. Just Transition must center food sovereignty, decommodify basic uh, needs such as water um, and all other basic needs, and show equal distribution of resources. It is not confined to technologies, nor to academic interest of institutional researchers. It is all of us changing the way of life. It is therefore a struggle against ourselves. The current challenges we are facing in most communities, there is exclusion of both communities, workers from key decision-making. The extractive industry, mostly the mining companies continue to uproot communities in the name of development, thereby creating dependency and a society of, of beggars. So just transition talks about paradigm shift, which simply says we need not to create a society of both beggars going forward. We, workers continue to lose their jobs. So Mike mentioned this. Hence, the increased levels of uh, unemployment leading to violence in our communities, including uh, gender-based violence. Our sister spoke about that. The loss of biodiversity, which includes um, all the water sources, soil quality leading to declining food quality. I think just transition must address that. Uh, there's an increased commercialization of basic services, including the supply of water. Uh, through this, what you call water doses and so forth. We need to challenge that. Hence, I said, just transition is the new battleground. Climate change definitely is forcing people to migrate. And the end result that we have faced in most communities, mining affected communities, is uh, violence, xenophobia, militarization of society and suppressing of suppression of communities and workers. What we need to urgently do, we need to simplify and free just transition from its confines. I think at the moment, just transition is not within our communities. It is not understood what it means by in communities. We need to close the gap between communities, workers, and stop talking or preaching about just transition and start supporting and rolling out just transition alternatives. We need to localize just transition through community and worker dialogues, including speak outs, and ensure that we activate the role of our local municipalities. Rechannel our campaigns, resources towards bottom up alternatives and break free from the chains of our oppressions, we normally see them as ornaments, the luxuries, and all other things. We need to intensify our actions against the conservative forces that are seeking to maintain the status quo. One of the reasons why there's so much confusion and hesitation is simply because those that are driving the engines of this fossil fuel industry are creating confusion these are what I call the, the, the conservative forces. We need to center just transition in every movement building process. For this terrain is contested. For the industry, for the capitalist system, just transition simply means they must continue to extract and exploit and make, make super profits. But for us, just transition means the future, means peace, means free, Freedom from hunger, 
and poverty, unemployment, violence. In looking at just transition, we need to go beyond our current colonial boundaries. I'm looking at the current opportunities. Changing our lifestyles will result in reduced consumerism. There's so much that we buy, there's so much that we actually take. We, some of the things are actually useless and they end up in the dumping sites. We need to change our lifestyles. We need to focus on the reputation of all the current abandoned mines, including industry side, so that we generate more jobs. The current houses needs to be retrofitted, insulated so that they are not cold in winter. They are not too hot in summer. They, then they will use less energy. We need to support agroecology as a way towards food security, but not only food security, but will ensure food sovereignty, reduce hunger, poverty, create work opportunity, not jobs per se, but work opportunity and lead to carbon reduction. Socially owned renewable energy is very much important and key to the future so that we can have more sustainable jobs for our youth, for our community members. We need to redesign our public roads. Efficient and effective uh, public transport will also create jobs. Restoring our ecosystem, water is, is a huge opportunity for all of us. With the little support that we have re we received from CCFD, Indalo Inclusive, uh, engaging with the local municipality, especially the mayoral office, the premier's office, the Department of Agriculture, who were able to run an agroecology initiative in the area of Emalatene. It was not easy, but it became one of the key challenges. Rolling out, we included ex-workers, unemployed community members, women that are heading families, and the project has proven to be a success. So we have amongst us the youth, the ex-mine workers in some of the pictures that you see is myself, Inyanda youth, the youth of Emalakhen, members of the SHRC, members of the National Union of Metal Workers, ex-NUMSA members. And indeed, success only relies on us breaking the chains and committing to the alternatives. Currently, we have 15 families that are benefiting directly from the initiative. We have created 35 opportunities, work opportunities, and we have been, which are inclusive of those that are producing and distributing. We aim to us supplying the entire 12,000 Siyangoba houses and beyond with vegetables, we are in the process to host our food producers market in different sections of the community. We are asking all progressive formations to start similar initiatives to support by buying and produce, I mean, buying produce from similar initiatives for their conferences, seminars, and so forth. I think the struggle for just transition is now, and we must realize there is no life no livelihood and no jobs in a dead planet. So with those words, I would like to thank you and say I fully concur with my previous panelists. And indeed, it is a challenge for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthews. I, 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 I think um, a, a, a lot of what you said uh, also spoke to what Matt Sapiso was saying you know, just uh, giving a picture, but more specifically of the mining communities and that the, the, the living in, in that environment and having been there, I, I really do resonate with what you're saying. Um, although I'm not living there, so I, I, I'm, I'm aware it's very different. You, you've talked about prioritizing human rights and power relations. And I think it, it is 
in and of itself a huge topic that probably needs to be um, ded a dedicated session to, to those issues uh, of power, um, power relations and community exclusion in the extractive industries. Um, you also talked uh, about, which I think um, Matsupiso was saying, that all of us um, need to change our way of life. And it's, it's a struggle against ourselves. Those were your words. And I think in your description of the work that you're doing, um, it, 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 you're actually working with, with those um, with, with, with people changing, but you again talk about education and closing the gap and simplifying some of the terms. So I think um, I think uh, it, you've raised really important issues. I mean, I think all of our panelists have been quite amazing, and we've got one last panelist, and um, uh, that's uh, Hamida Didat, who, who is from, um, so thank you, thank you so much, Matthews. Um, and Hamida is from Naledi, and I'm going to introduce you properly. I, I at the beginning, um, when I talked about the consortium that's working on this project, I, I talked about myself and tips. It's Naledi and Groundwork. Um, we're, we're working together on the project. So um, Hamida is going to speak for about five minutes or so to present um, the, the labor perspective. So she has been the acting executive director of Naledi, the research arm of the Congress of South, Africa, South African Trade Unions since 2016 and she's a senior researcher in the organization um, researching on key issues around the impact uh, that impact labor and the working class in South Africa and internationally um, and she has a specific focus on energy minimum wage global value chains um, the gender and um, also around water and um, Hamida, you, you're very experienced and I'm looking forward to, to you kind of bringing these um, three perspectives almost together through a labor lens. And then I'm very keen to hear from participants. Um, oh, thanks. So over to you, Hamida. Thanks very much. Thank Good afternoon to everybody. Thanks, Hamida. So we're sitting in a, in a conference or basically a workshop where we've been working with our trade union comrades over the last two days, really engaging quite extensively on the issue of the just transition, um, trying very strongly to get labor to articulate um, our own position. And you know, we, as, as you've indicated, Peter, we're the, the research arm for Kosatu, but we do not have a mandated position. We can come to forums like this where we can articulate what we believe should be a labor perspective. We can raise the concerns. The challenges, but ultimately, you know, the articulation should come from the affiliates themselves, um, not necessarily only leadership, but I think various comrades who engage in the climate change space. So we've got our comrades with, uh, from NIM very enthusiastically entering the room. Um, but I think the, the key point is how do we facilitate a process where our comrades actually engage in this process? So I think if you look at the topic, um, which speaks specifically to how does one ensure the voices of workers or the voices of communities. I mean, of course, one of the issues that we do from a labor perspective and because we hold a research space, um, we ensure that we work with government, at civil society organizations, we, we work with our trade unions and through the various processes, um, we navigate, um, you know, we navigate quite uh, sophisticatedly, I think, um, ways in which we can ensure that the sound, the interest, the voices, um, and more particularly the contestations, because that's what we are, right? We, we contest the current dogma, we contest the capitalist system, we contest the, the impacts and the negative impacts in particular in the context of climate change um, that we are experiencing. And in many instances, this impact is on workers, it's on communities and in the context of climate change, it's on the environment. I think what's also important in the current context when we're discussing the issue of the just transition 
is that we're finding more and more that what was a labor principle um, taken at one of the COP meetings has now been misappropriated and has become a term or a concept or a vision or a strategy by those who actually don't understand from my perspective or from a labor perspective, what a just transition actually is. So from, from Naledi, what we do, and I think as part of the consortium, but I think also as other, as we work in other spaces is we work with our comrades um, through our climate change reference group, through conferences, like the one that we had in collaboration with AIDC. Um, we go into communities like we're doing now in the, in the context of Imalakhleni, uh, Vidbank um, and, and Steve Twitter municipalities and really working and engaging with our comrades across the unions where possible to be able to firstly ensure that workers themselves feel confident um, that they have the knowledge and the understanding of what is what they be, what's what they are experiencing but then secondly to facilitate a process where workers then feel confident that they are able to articulate both their concerns, um, their issues, and then make demands of what needs to happen. Um, and you know, in many instances when we go, and I think what is absolutely critical is when you go into spaces where you're working with constituencies, there's many a times there's an assumption from a methodological perspective that the people that you're engaging or the comrades that you're engaging need to be taught. I think what we do and what I think would be absolutely imperative and is something that I engaged the PCC around is that comrades know. There's nobody, and I think the previous comrades uh, from, from, from labor, uh, from community raised this. There's no better person than somebody who's affected, whose life is affected by coal or a coal miner or someone who's not able to access clean water to tell you what the consequences are of, of, of not having access to those resources. People in Secunda who don't have access to, to clean air um, and who suffer the health implications as a result of high levels of air pollution. There's no one better to explain what that means for them, for their livelihoods, for their, for their community, for their families, other than the constituency or the people themselves. And so I believe that this is absolutely true for labor as well. Um, what is happening, I think in, in certain spaces, I mean, obviously there's the NEDLAC process. So you've got some engagement happening at NEDLAC, but there seems to be a lack of synergy between what's happening at NEDLAC, what's happening at the PCC, um, what's happening at local or, or, or national government level, and then definitely what is happening in terms of the kind of work um, that we are doing, um, which is a lot more grounded, a lot more um, working with the various affiliates, trying to capacitate and engage as many of our comrades as possible so that they can take forward these particular issues. So I think the important thing, if, if we're talking about a principle of ensuring a bottoms up approach, I think there needs to be a recognition that every single voice, particularly those of the marginalized is absolutely imperative, that if we are truly committed to a just transition, that we need to recognize that the just transition doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. From a labor perspective, as I've indicated several times, it's a worker-centric approach um, with a balance for addressing the concerns of the community as well as the environment. And I think for us, this is a fundamental opportunity, I think for all of us involved in this particular space to really reevaluate re the system that we're currently in, the, the negative impacts that it's brought for us and then together um, forge a way, a way forward. Um, and in, in that trajectory, I think particularly because it's called a just transition, labor should be given the space. Um, and, and I think when, you, when you're talking about the procedural justice that um, Gayla was making reference to, there will not be procedural justice if you do not ensure that labor's voice is the leading voice in the context of a just transition. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Hamida. Um, I, I'm, I'm really glad I did the order that I did um, because I think you, you've brought the conversation somehow um, in, in, to, to, to an, a nice um, closure from the panelist side. You, 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 you saying that this is, you, you ended with saying there's a fundamental opportunity to reevaluate the system and that we need to recognize that every voice is imperative. So the, 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 the problem is that we're not facilitating that sufficiently. That's what we're hearing. And we're, we're not also, I think what's come across very strongly is the, the, the situation of people who are living in mining communities, whether they're miners or, or living there, 
and, and the impact of mining on them. I think you, you've, um, you, you said that workers need to feel that they can articulate how they're feeling. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm kind of wondering about the how at the moment. Um, and I would like to open to the floor and hope that um, there are some um, people that would like to speak. And, and I would like you to just, if you could use the reactions button at the bottom on the right, if you click on that, it, 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 you can do a raise hand and then you can unmute yourself. Um, and we'll also look a little bit at the chat. I've been trying to follow it a tiny bit and Gayla will come in. And I'd also like to welcome our panelists um, to, to respond. So um, I'm just looking to see if anyone is brave enough to raise their hand. And uh, uh, we have um, Bongani, um, would you um, unmute yourself and then Cynthia, and then oh, oh we've got and um, and Mika. If I hope I've pronounced your name correctly, we'll start with Bongani. Can you just please keep your responses um, very succinct and say who you are, please? Thank you. Over to you, Bongani. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for, 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 for this informative um, workshop or webinar. Um, my name is Ubongani Munidi. I'm from Asazbo. Um, directly to, to, um, to, to Hamida, we, we, we've engaged extensively in the past um, with Hamida at Sazbo. But then now, in, when I follow her, she, she, she's showing um, what is a, tran uh, a just transition from a labor perspective. But then now, she talks of lack of um, synergy with what's happening at NetLeg, PCC, and just transition. Now, in terms of the Tamida, how do we then align the voices uh, so that the synergy um, will, 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 talk, will, 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 will talk with one voice? Um, that, that, that is just the, the, the crux of what I would like us, um, you to share with us in terms of aligning the voices to, um, in terms of um, just transition from a labor perspective, at la, um, la, um, uh, aligning the voices. And then Michael Nkosi's talk of a structural, um, a structural platforms and that are used for participation purposes. Um, what, what, what I find uh, um, uh, disturb, uh, disturbing is he articulates the problem and, and uh, all the challenge in terms of this platform not being used for, the in, for, for their um, internet purposes other than uh, being used as a uh, tick box exercise. Now, who do we hold accountable in terms of these um, platforms not being used for their intended purposes now. For them, um, for us, when we move from this webinar, going forward to say, uh, these platforms, we use, we're not gonna use them for as a tick box exercise, but we're gonna use them, we're going to use these platforms as a means of engaging communities and labor together uh, so that they can have a voice in, 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 in terms of uh, going forward. And then, okay. uh, Pramathew, um, finally, he, he talks of communities uh, playing an active role. Now, in terms of communities playing an active role, um, just transition from the community perspective should have its seat at local government. From there, we hold um, senior government and municipality officials accountable for public participation because now what um, Michael said is that platforms are used as ticking box exercises. As long as uh, the, uh, we don't have the seat of just transition in local government, we'll continue um, uh, having communities being alienated. And then um, we won't have 
anyone to hold accountable. Set up and maintain public knowledge platforms for open access to information within the local government. And then we hold um, communities um, accountable. Lastly, I, recommend, I would like to commend the state uh, local municipality for taking the petition and running with it for this webinar. I so wish um, that other municipalities can follow suit because we need a just transition to sit within the local government and within municipalities for communities to be involved and participate. Thank you so much. Thank, so you very, thank you, Bongani. I'm, I'm going to take a couple more of the hands. Thank you very much. And then I'll, I'll give the floor to the four panelists. Um, I think, Cynthia, you were the next in line. Um, if you could keep your questions or comments fairly brief and then um, just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. My name is Cynthia Tukise Kobela. I'm from Sirdecom. It's uh, south of Johannesburg. I'm a farmer. I just want to uh, comment on what uh, Matsipiso has said, that uh, the people on the ground need to be attended to. And talking from the agricultural side, of, of, of this meeting is that we are helping the people, for example, now to grow their own food and to participate in feeding themselves so that they can be sustainable. What we find is that most of the communities need to be helped. They need to come for training or whatever, but unfortunately they don't have funds to do that. And we would like that, um, the local municipality should get a touch base with the people on the ground, like the people who've got academies, like the Matsepis on them from the Green Business College and try to subsidize the people. They can eat and they can be able to, to help themselves while the government is busy correcting the mining things and the other issues that we have. I think that's all from my side. Um, I think Mika, you're next. Thank you, Cynthia. I've noticed your, I've noted your, the, all the comments so far. Let's go with uh, Mika, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mika. I live in Cape Town and um, I don't represent any organization. Uh, I'm just a, an interested citizen. Um, I'd like to ask around the concept of the facilitators of the current spaces um, of power and engagement. And these appear to be actors who have traditionally held power such as TIPS or a university affiliated or research institute affiliated body, um, government actors and, and corporate actors holding the space of just transition. But um, the presenters have touched on um, where there is traction being built at ground level, at grassroots level, amongst marginalized communities. I'd just like to know if, if any more detail can be given about um, some of the successful activations and activities from those grassroots and ground level movements and communities that are making space as opposed to just being allowed into the space because that is even still a very top-down view or perception of how engagement should happen. Thank you. I'm going to take to Bohon and then hand over to the panelists. Um, and thank you, Mika, for, for your question. Um, Tiboko, please introduce yourself. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much, Chairperson uh, 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 Peter. Uh, I'm not Tiboko, but uh, I'm Tebe Mama Koko from the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Uh, I'm appearing as Tiboko in the um, uh, in the in the in the platform. 
Um, and indeed, I just want to thank uh, the panelists uh, for their comments. Um, and I think uh, just to say that uh, most of the comments that they are raising actually resonate um, uh, with uh, the, the work that uh, we have uh, begun to, to do as the department uh, in, in, in the context of the uh, just energy transition within the broader frame of just uh, transition as led by the uh, Presidential Climate Commission. And I think, uh, uh, the, I think it's Michael who indeed uh, raised the issue uh, or, or almost all the speakers raised the issue around uh, ensuring that we have a, 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 or we ensure that these platforms that are created are actually uh, platforms that uh, will be the vehicle for people to, uh, you know, uh, air their views, but also ensure that those views are being taken into consideration as we are, we are, we are transitioning to, um, uh, uh, to low carbon economy. So as a department, we've been um, uh, in the process of developing a framework. And I think I need to clarify, as I've seen that there are also journalists here, uh, that uh, there's no contradiction. Uh, the framework that we are developing, which we are actually consulting with stakeholders, uh, is around ensuring that uh, we, we work with all the stakeholders, uh, particularly the, the affected communities, to monitor and evaluate the impact uh, or the socioeconomic impact of the policies that we have identified as government, uh, in, uh, one of those being the IRP, uh, as we are implementing it uh, through uh, or up until 2030, um, uh, so that we are able to, to understand uh, the impact of uh, the issues around skills, um, uh, what skills are, are we putting in line with those people that are, are likely to be affected uh, in the coal uh, value chain, uh, but also in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the creation of uh, uh, small corporates and, and, and investment opportunities, uh, particularly in those areas that are affected and, and broadly uh, within the, so, uh, the, the, the economy uh, uh, in, the, in the country. So, for us, uh, and I've got no mandate uh, to, to speak on, 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 the, on behalf of the department, but I was invited uh, to, this, uh, to this meeting uh, through, through my colleague table. So I thought I should reflect uh, the work that we are doing and also appreciate the inputs that colleagues are actually uh, putting on, on, on uh, to the fore. And then and saying that uh, we'll be interested in working with them to ensure that all these issues that they've, uh, they've, uh, they've raised are actually being uh, uh, taken to, including the formulation of the structure uh, that will, will be a proper vehicle, uh, at least when it comes to uh, mining and energy uh, uh, sector issues, uh, to be able to touch base and, 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 and indeed uh, talk to those that are, are really going to be affected by this. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair, and, and uh, thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you for your, your input and um, giving us some background to what you're doing. I would really like to call on the panelists to respond. Um, I think each of you have had um, somebody raise a question or a comment and um, um, maybe uh, if uh, I, I don't know if you need me to just um, summarize, um, but perhaps you could all put your videos on and uh, and respond. So we've had. Um, uh, I'll just summarize very quickly what I, I, I'm hoping you've taken notes. So to you, Hamida, how do we align voices um, to Michael? um you, you, you who 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 do how do people how do you how do you make um gov local government accountable how do you go forward um with uh, to matthews i think um you are you were asked how do we take the committees um, give them a more active role within the local government platform. Um, then um, Cynthia, I think that, 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 that was Bongani and Cynthia raised the uh, 
the 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 plight of rural well people agricultural farmer people in working on farms and um how they can be drawn in so that they they are helped and yeah how uh, perhaps some i think mika you were asking for um successful grassroots examples the colleague from DMRE, I didn't catch his name. I think he's just had to leave. Um, they are doing work around uh, stakeholder engagement. But the question I would have had for him, for him or that, that I could ask the panelists to um, talk to is, is this, are these more platforms? How do we make them more effective, I suppose? so. Perhaps um, we'll go, Hamida first, can, can I ask you to all put your videos on, please, the panelists, and Gaylor, please come in if you also have a, a, a response, or, and I'll look for other participants. Um, Thanks, Peter. So I think my issue wasn't so much about stakeholder voice, it was more around how do we align the different labor uh, spaces. So for example, NEDLAC, uh, the general secretaries of because the general secretary of Kasatu, uh, political leadership, and then obviously educators or officials who are taking forward the issues of the just transition. I think that was where Bongani was going, so that we could actually be a lot more effective. Um, and I think what I'm going to do, Comrade Peter, if you don't mind, I'm going to hand over to Comrade Sipo from Sepao, who's actually in our reference group meeting at the moment and is joining. I think uh, in 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 lieu of actually allowing participants to speak and claim the space, but also labour. I'm going to hand over to him to make the input. Thanks very much. Thank you. My name is Siko Lamini from Sepao. Uh, uh, Provincial Secretary of Sepao. Um, from Pumala. Uh, I will try to, to, to ask a question in terms of how do we align ourselves? And 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 say in one voice of in terms of, of this uh, exercise that we are doing. Um, look, comrade, as labor, it's not a secret that uh, it looks like we have we have not. Uh, 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 supporting in this exercise by coming to the reference group and also engaging and try to assist in terms of the climate change. And also we must we, we must also remind ourselves that this issue that uh, uh, corporate Hamila and the entire way. I think everybody's lost him. Um, I'm going to ask the, I'm going to ask um, uh, Michael and um, Matthews and Matsupiso to please come in now. Thanks, uh, thanks Peter. Can I come in now? Yes, go ahead and- Yeah within the government space there are two people that you need to hold accountable firstly it's the public representative because the platforms are created for them to disseminate information and answer any questions or question that might come from the community but in turn the public representatives have the administrators to hold accountable as officials, we write the report, we do the work, we write the report and present to the political representatives. And if things are not in accordance to the expectations of the community and the mandate given to the public representative, then those representatives need to hold the, the administrators, the public servants accountable for the work done or not done. But also we need to look at the attitude in general. 
you that's personal observation though is that not everyone is development oriented people just do their work because it's their work it's it's the paper pushing type of an attitude but somebody who wants to see development will go an extra mile in doing that the work he or she is assigned to do and therefore that determines the quality of the work that will be delivered the services that will be delivered to a, a particular economy so two people the politician and the public servant should be held accountable that is within government for the work done or not done thank you thank you very much um i i know that uh, i think um uh, comrade sipa is av available but perhaps um i saw that uh, matthews and and um i'm just looking at we've got time matthews and um Matsupiso, would you like to come in and then i'm going to hand back to sipa Thank you, thank you, um, thank you, Peter. Um, in responding to, to the question uh, raised specifically by Bongani, I, I in, indicated in the presentation that this is a serious struggle. Uh, communities uh, throughout, especially in the mining affected communities, need to continue organizing and fighting to reclaim power from both the public representatives, that is the politicians in local government, provincial government, and national government. Communities must actually reclaim power from even the civil servants, the public you know, civil servants, who have actually stolen the power uh, together with the politicians and are protected by the privileges with uh, actually the privileges that are full of resources to can suppress the power uh, of the community. So the starting point is for communities to organize themselves, to raise awareness, through various forms, community speak outs, it could be the community radio station, so that we establish a deeper understanding of what just transition means. That obviously includes the workers. You know what actually happened between the government officials who are benefiting from the system, uh, the politicians who are benefiting from the system, the industry representatives, they are create, deliberately creating fear so that we can fear the future. We are fearing to transition. So that is a struggle for us to say, we need to actually take over and reclaim that power. And that is not gonna come easy. They are resisting. They've got resources which we don't have. And they, they, they've got guys to tell us we cannot live or we can not survive without this or that. So it is a struggle for us. And unfortunately, some of the things we've got to do it ourselves. They are not going to roll out and support initiatives in a just way. They'll always want in one or way or another, extract from whatever project or initiative that is being rolled out. They'll always want to bring in nepotism in, what, in whatever way, so that they can actually frustrate and demoralize communities. So we've got that responsibility to stand up and fight for the future. Just transition should actually happen now. I hear the, 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 the gentleman from DMRE about that particular draft paper and the engagement. But the reality in Emalashene today, there's violence, people are unemployed. We've got these violent economic groups that are scavenging all over. Do you want to see such a situation perpetuated whilst you are waiting for the document to be concluded? The time is now for communities to stand up and take over and reclaim their power. If there is land that all is owned by a mining company and is not utilized, take that land, produce food. Not the tomorrow, but today, because we are hungry now. A hungry stomach knows no law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm yes. going to hand to Matsupiso and then back yes, please. to 
SIPO um, and um, but I, and, and then I, I to, at the end, I will try and sum up this. It's been an amazing conversation. Um, Matt Supiso, over to you. Excellent. I, I'm really burning. You know, for me, I cannot believe that even 20 years later, we are still talking about uh, information and awareness and, uh, and lack of information dissemination on what projects we are doing. Um, you know, for me, transition is change. And like I said before, change uh, begins in the, in, the, in the mind, mindset change. And I believe our people now, they've really changed. We have been advocating for people to change the mindset. And now people are ready, people are willing to get their, to get their hands dirty. So I believe, like Bram Matthews is saying, we must now make sure that we, 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 we do action now. You know, I, I don't remember how many years ago we've always been saying climate action now, but nothing is happening. So let's act, act now. And by acting, let's support um, people who are willing to get their hands dirty today and now. Let, let's, let's give them skills and tools of trade to really make a difference in their own lives because people are working and people are willing and people are able to make the difference in their own lives. And the, the last thing is, um, we also as people, we must empower ourselves and take back the power because like Brametis is saying, it's a struggle. And therefore, if it's a struggle, then let's take the power uh, from, you know, from the people and, 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 do, and make our own change and implement and, and produce our own food. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matsupiso. Um, Hamida, can, can I hand back to Sipo, please? Uh, look, uh, I will not dwell much uh, in terms of uh, a community. I think the community has tried to, to dwell with it and also raise their views in terms of that. I will be more specifically on the labor issues especially from NetLeg to, to the federations, because federations are sitting there at NetLeg and also the business. Look, this issue is very sensitive. And uh, to us who are affected, it is very close to our heart. Uh, I think what will assist us so that we can be here very correctly. I think for from us as different affiliate union who are sitting here, it is our duty to go back to our, to our respective affiliates and engage with them that here is the issue that is destroying our lives, our community, and also our workplace, and also the labor. Because if we are not doing that, and also we are coming to these classes and learn, and then not going back, and also try to implement what we have been discussing here, we will be not doing justice from these uh, classes or these sessions. So I think it is our duty as us as labor uh, unions uh, affiliated in our respective unions to go back and, and engage with our leaders um, that here is the problem. It has been since been discussed, but nothing that is happening. And it seems as if your leadership on the higher level does not attend to this issue. And uh, I won't speak about the government, but we as labor unions affiliate, affiliated to Federation of Kosatu, we can, we can make this uh, classes work to, to go and discuss with our 
alliance partners, that is government, the ruling party, because the ruling party is running away because we as COSATU affiliate who are sitting here, we are not making them accountable. We are just sitting and have information, but we are not saying anything to our, to, to our alliance partners. I think if we can take that route as, as comrades who are sitting here and have a, a, a word or a say to say, we've been sitting there and uh, this is what is it's, it's, it's killing our country. I think uh, on those views, I think we can work together to have one voice. Then on the issue of, uh, I, 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 I just want to touch to this question to say, who do you hold accountable from this platform? In and out, this platform has done a lot of jobs, a lot of work, a lot of awareness in terms of what is transpired in the climate change call and stuff like that. I think who is accountable? It's where this group report to. Those people can be held accountable because this group has made a research. They have opened awareness. They have opened the group so that we can raise our voice. And they, surely they do have reporting somewhere. I think that's where they are being accountable. For example, for Naledi, if COSATU want a report, that means COSATU must be held accountable to say, Naledi has done this and they have submitted to you. Then COSATU must be held accountable. I think I will stop it there. Then when we engage, we will discuss while we are engaging. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that contribution. I see Matthews has his hand up and I wanted to ask, uh, I, I mean, I think you, you, Supra, you made some really important uh, points there, which I'm going to draw on in the when I, when in the conclusion. But I also I'm going to give the floor to Matthews. But I also want to ask if there are any other people here who would like to speak. Um, would be really wonderful to hear um, from uh, if there's if there are people from communities that would like to speak. Okay, Matthews, over to you. Thank you, and thanks to, to, to Comrade Sipo. Um, he has pointed out to the fact that um, we have always had discussions, the challenges in the leadership, and then he also touched on who's accountable. I think we are also accountable, Comrade Sipo, um, as activists, as leading trade union leaders, as community leaders, uh, for letting our communities down, for letting the workers down. I think what is actually key uh, at the current moment, we see workers losing their jobs. We see our communities every day uh, getting more violent, including gender-based violence. And um, we live in these communities, we are not ignorant. And if we are not ignorant, we know the task. We know what we need to do. I think on the issue of engaging with leaders, I'll be very much, uh, uh, I'll very much appreciate the day where we as communities, including trade union leaders like uh, Kosatu Saftu, identify this land which is owned by these mining companies and go and occupy it. Those that are in the alliance will then engage with the alliance after the occupation. The day we as communities and workers occupy and close some of these mines that are discharging acidic water into the stream and start rehabilitating and engage for resources from government. This is the radical approach that we need. But if we think that uh, it will come from above, from those that are already swimming in the pool of privileges, it won't happen. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. That, thank you for that. Um, are, are, is there anybody, I don't see hands, but I would like to, we have about 10 minutes. Um, I'd really like to take some voices from the floor if anybody would like to speak. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to give last. I don't see any hands. I don't know if the panelists or Gaylor have last comments, and, and otherwise, I'm going to wrap up in a, in a few minutes. Okay, I see somebody from Naledi. That might be you, Hamida. I'm not sure. Please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Sizwe. Uh, oh, hi, Sizwe. Nice to uh, hear you. Um, I think, you know, the one thing that um, even in our discussions that we held here today, one of the most critical things in, in, in a just transition or in transitioning or moving away from coal, if we are to have a just transition, we need to have a localization strategy as front and center and an industrial policy that ensures that this transition uh, is pushed or, or, or the manufacturing of the or getting of the goods and services needed in this transition um, are, are localized. Um, so we definitely need to ensure that we have a, a localized uh, industrial policy. Uh, that for me is quite central. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Siswe. Um, I'm going to ask um, our panelists and Gaylor uh, to make closing points. Matsupisa, please go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Peter. Um, my last point is, you know, whether you're talking about business, you're talking about workers, you're talking about communities, you're talking about government, all of the people that I mentioned, we are all people. And whatever happens, whether it's climate change, whether it's um, inequality, whether it's poverty, whether it's crime. So all of us are people, whether we are workers or communities or business or, or government, we are all people. And I think post COVID, this, we, are, we are under a new normal where we really have to go back to basics and see what is important. It is no longer about money because uh, this pandemic, whether it's climate change or COVID, they are all killing us, whether we are whether we are rich or poor. So we must really go back to basics and really um, and, 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 and live the truth rather than being selfish about, about life. And the truth is people need to eat. Food is the number one thing. And therefore, and eating healthy so that we can be healthy is, is our utmost important because all these things, including COVID and, and climate change and many other problems will be solved once we are eating healthy from the, the food from our hands. So let's go back to um, uh, uh, supporting us with skills. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matsupiso. Hamida. Thanks, Kamir Peters. Somebody raised the issue around power relations. I think okay. it's important, you know, that we really pick up that we are unequal um, in, in, in terms of the kind of power that we can exert the voices that get channels through and the spaces in which those voices can be can articulate the, the issues and concerns. I think what we've been doing both as Naledi, but also through our consortium and other spaces have been trying to facilitate platforms, I think in relation to enrichment. We've really been trying to, to give people and I think workers the confidence. And I think, you know, as you hear more and more of our comrades speaking, both Comrade Bongani as well as Comrade Sipo and a couple of others come through a space where we've been engaging and providing the space for comrades to feel confident. But I think when you when we've got so many odds and you listen to the challenges um, that was raised throughout, people get intimidated. And I think more importantly, in the current context where we're contesting austerity, people are demanding for jobs, we're looking at you know, this issue around Hendrina that was almost closed and the devastation around Mpumalanga. I mean, we've been raising this. I mean, you were part of the NPCC process, NPC process. These issues have been raised, but sometimes if the, if the person on the other end or the, 
the institution on the other end is not receiving the voices, um, then more than people not wanting to participate, it's also a sense of helplessness. So I think power plays quite a fundamental role um, in, in why and how people can engage. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Hamida. Um, I don't know, Mike, we're almost running out of time, but if Michael and Matthews and Gaylor have last words, please. Peter, thanks. Uh, we had a good discussion, but I still feel we need to do so more work on this issue. Our approach is fragmented and we also not honest enough because the information needs to be disseminated out there irrespective of how bad it is so we need to be honest with our communities and thirdly we need to account to these local communities where we're doing our work both as government business and other key players thank you um thank you michael uh, matthews do you have uh, a last word Thanks, thanks, uh, Peter. Um, I think we've got a responsibility, um, as uh, Michael has just said. We, we need to reach out. We need not to relax because all of us are living in communities, but we are insecure. All of us have to find ways every day to make sure that we are safe where we are because the unemployment, poverty, violence, uh, I mean, uh, unemployment, poverty, and hunger has breeded violence in our communities and our families. So for how long are we going to live in that environment? We see workers living in informal settlements, ex mine workers losing their houses simply because they've lost their job. We see ex-mine workers, ex-industry, high fuel steel workers in Emalatlin unable to buy purified water simply because they've lost their jobs. We see the union leaders and community leaders driving around in expensive cars. Can we do something? I think the time is now. Um, we, we, we are really challenged. So tomorrow is another day, we are not so sure if we we'll still have the opportunity to talk to each other, because the violence is brewing in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm just going to uh, sum up some of the key points and then hand over to Gaylor to close. I, I, I really think there's been an amazing conversation. And I, I think what I take away, and I, I, I think our project will take away, is that we're, we're, we're just, it's the tip of the iceberg, really, what we've talked about here today. Um, we all need to engage. Power relations need to be addressed in an open and honest way. We need to really look at the platforms and structures in place and work together to, to change those, to enable everybody's voice to be heard. And we all, each of us is also accountable. I, I heard that, uh, I think it was um, Matthews from you. Violence we haven't really addressed that's happening in communities. Um, and we, 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 we need to address that and um, perhaps be, talk about it more and the impact it has on the work we're, we're doing. So there are, I think, um, Michael, you talked at the end about of our approach is fragmented. And I think there's a lot happening, but we do need to uh, synergize or, or work more collaboratively. And somebody said we need a radical approach. So I think I will finish on that and then hand over to Gaylor to close. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amida. And yeah, it just remains for me to, to really thank our fantastic uh, panel. Uh, thank you so much to, uh, to uh, Matthew Piso, to Amida, to, to Michael, to Matthews, uh, and to, to everyone who came in as well and attended. Um, and, and thank you to you, Peter, really for a fantastic job today. Uh, I think we you know, only scratched the surface, as you, as you said, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. 
I think we're creating this platform to engage about it and hopefully design some, some solutions going forward. It's always easier to point out the problems than to solve them. But I think that's by co-creating that space together, we can uh, have those honest discussion, those frank uh, analysis, and this kind of reality check, and then design the solutions uh, together. I think that was an exceptionally condu uh, conducive session today. I thank you all. Uh, I wish you well and look out for the recording as well as the presentations, uh, as well as future events. Uh, thank you, everyone, and all the best. Bye-bye.